This spring, Democratic state lawmakers advanced legislation designed to promote more accurate demographic data collection by the state, specifically as it pertains to New Yorkers of Middle Eastern and North African descent who are currently aggregated, often erroneously, under the quote-unquote white label for the purposes of data collection by New York's government, according to supporters of the bill. Moving forward, the pending legislation that passed without opposition in the Senate and essentially without Republican support in the Assembly would require every state entity that collects ethnic origin data to make a distinction for people of Middle Eastern or North African ancestry. To discuss the reasoning behind the bill, we're joined by the measure's Assembly sponsor, Queens Democrat Jessica Gonzalez-Rojas. Welcome back to the show, Assembly Member. Thank you, David, for having me. So according to the legislative memorandum, this was a a new bill when you introduced it in early 2023. How did it get onto your radar? So I've long worked with different ethnic communities. I've worked in the civil rights and racial justice space for many years. And my district was redistricted into Astoria. And Astoria has such a large and vibrant uh, Middle Eastern North African population. But when I looked at the data that showed the demographics in my community, I went from having a district that was about 12% white to one that was 27% white. But me knowing the community in Astoria, I knew that a lot of the people that were considered white were actually of Middle Eastern and North African descent. It's something I've worked on in the past um, in terms of census. And I work very closely with organizations and leaders on the ground that work specifically with the Middle Eastern North African community. And uh, especially I wanna give a shout out to Rana Abdul Halmid from uh, Malaka, who said we should uh, find a way to address this. So it came from the community, which is incredible. And I'm really proud to have gotten it passed. Well, when you say you looked at the data and you saw that it didn't accurately represent the communities you were now serving, what was the data that you turned to that was not as accurate as it otherwise could have been? What, what are the different forms of information that we're collecting that's not as precise as it could be? Redistricting happens two years after the, uh, the census uh, is done every 10 years. So the data comes largely from the U.S. census data that requires that Middle Eastern and North African populations check the white box. And the census data on race and ethnicity has evolved over many years. And the difference between past census and the 2020 census is that for the first time under each racial category, they ask the participants to write their origin. And then they give examples. So if you look at the census from 2020, it'll say, uh, you know, check off your race and you could check off more than one, but under white, It gives examples like Irish, Italian, German, and then it specifically says um, Middle Eastern, and I believe Turkish. I I don't have it in front of me, but I know it it highlights um, two countries that are in either the Middle East or North Africa. So um, it it, it specifically says that if you identify within uh, those countries or from those countries or with ethnic origins in those countries that you should Uh, click the white data. So that's something new. Um, So for the first time, the data can be disaggregated at the federal level, but in terms of what is used for the redistricting data, it is the broader categories. It is uh, white, it is Hispanic, it is black, it is Asian, and they don't disaggregate. Uh, They don't disaggregate the Asian data too, uh, which is unfortunate because there's certainly a difference between Filipinos and Bangladeshis and other AAPI communities, uh, but the data that is used for redistricting included white as a larger category and didn't disaggregate for the Middle Eastern and North African communities that are within that. Well, for the purposes of your bill and the state entities that you can impact, what would this mean for data collection moving forward? What would the process be? Is it something akin to what we just talked about with the census, or would it be something different? Well, this bill was really modeled off a bill that was uh, signed into law in 2021 that uh, actually requires the state to start disaggregating data by the Asian American Pacific Islander community. 
those communities are very diverse. Uh, you know, you have everything from Korean and Chinese to Filipino and Bangladeshi and Pakistani. So it's very important to understand the distinctions within those communities. And we modeled our bill very similarly to that bill that was signed into law. It's uh, taken some time to start transitioning to do that disaggregation. Um, and in our bill, we allow for that transition to happen in 2025 and 2026. But again, we really hope to pull out that information so that we can get data that's important from everything from health disparities to environmental justice communities, to redistricting, to MWBE programs for communities of color. Um, so that's really critical because the Middle Eastern North African population is excluded from that data because they're lumped into white. Well, can you expand on the practical implications of having more accurate data? Mm -hmm. Because proponents of the bill argue that the status quo has, quote unquote, real world impacts on services and resources uh, particular communities receive. Yeah, there's everything from uh, language access needs to cultural needs uh, to, you know, even with schools, like it'd be important to understand how many folks um, need halal food, right? That uh, many people of, of Middle Eastern North African descent uh, have used halal food uh, to the ways in which we're determining uh, environmental justice communities, right? And communities disproportionately impacted by pollution and that kind of thing. And I think the redistricting example for me is the perfect example that if I didn't have a good knowledge of my historic community that has a large Middle Eastern and North African population, I might not understand that, you know, there's religious, uh, cultural, linguistic needs and sensitivities um, in terms of the services I need to provide and the policies that I need to pass. Uh, so those are the things that are just really important for me as a policymaker to understand. The more information about the unique communities that we represent, the better we can represent them. So uh, again, I was really proud to carry this bill with Senator Janaris, who also represents large swaths of Astoria. Um, there's also obviously large Middle Eastern and North African populations in, in Brooklyn and across the state. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have the hard numbers because the data hasn't quite been collected and it's very difficult to, to get the disaggregated data. But there's estimations that we have upwards of you know, 300,000 to 500,000 Middle Eastern North African community members uh, throughout the state of New York that are rendered invisible because we don't have this information. So if your legislation became law, would it be up to individual New Yorkers to determine based on their own definition if they are of Middle Eastern or North African descent, or are you looking to impose some sort of eligibility standard? Well, the, we list the countries of origin in the bill. Um, but I guess, uh, it's, would you have to be a certain percent of your family was from a certain country or, or region in order to identify that way? Or would it be left up to the individual to determine if they've hit that threshold? Like all racial categories, it's, it's self-determination. So people identify, I am Latina, I click Latina. My father's from Paraguay, my mom's from Puerto Rico, I just click Latina. Uh, so yeah, it'd be up to, and that's how all racial data is collected. They don't take blood samples or determine a different you know, ratios of where your, your family's from. And again, in the census, they had asked people to do a write-in of their origin. Um, so a lot of the sense, the information would come from the census. Um, and we'd have to disaggregate that white category. Um, but fortunately, because there is a write-in option, option, we can you know, garner that data. But it just ensures that the agencies, boards, commissions, departments that collect data, this, these are for those entities, those state entities that already collect data, that the data needs to be disaggregated to include these communities. That's what the bill requires. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the 2021 law dealing with the uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, mm -hmm. and, and now we're talking about New Yorkers of Middle Eastern or North African descent. Do you think there are other groups 
where disaggregation is probably necessary with regards to our demographic data collection practices? I imagine so. I think, you know, for me as a Latina, I, I represent one of the most diverse districts in, I would argue, the world. I, I'm a pretty obsessed with data, so I like as much information as possible because some of these communities, although sort of wrapped into a particular racial ethnic category, um, have distinct needs within those communities. I think the AAPI community in particular were so diverse that it was really necessary to disaggregate that. And I was really proud to see that that bill got passed in 2021 and I was part of voting for it. Uh, but, you know, again, when the Middle Eastern and North African communities, people from Egypt or Morocco or Algeria or Tunisia or Iraq or, or Israel or Syria, like those people don't have lived experiences as uh, white people. They don't benefit from white privilege. It's really important to understand who they are, what communities they're living, how do we pass policies that, that serve those communities, and how do we recognize them for uh, programs and services that um, provide equity and uh, access to uh, scholarships or uh, support for small business owners or other sort of resources that uh, we're trying to right the wrongs of racial injustice in the past. When it comes to identity, I think there's probably a big difference between someone who might identify as of North African or Middle Eastern descent versus someone who might identify as white because they might have, say, a hodgepodge of European background. But during the debate on this issue, there was some conversation about this idea of, well, should we be collecting information about whether a person is from Western Europe or Eastern Europe, uh, et cetera? Do you feel like that is a false equivalency to the idea of being of, say, North African or Asian descent? Or do you feel like there is some merit to that idea of getting deeper into the white identity as well? I, I, I appreciate as much data as possible, but the realities of this country and the state is that there's white privilege, right? People uh, experience benefits due to the color. And even me as a light-skinned Latina, I recognize some of that privilege that I embody, even though I am Latina. For the Middle Eastern North African population, it was really critical to pull out their identity from the white category because they don't benefit from that a privilege, they don't identify as a white person. And again, they're, they're, they're racialized. Think about their, uh, the post 9-11 experience where they were being round up and, and, uh, and registered. And that's not the experience an Eastern or Western European person will experience. So this is something that we need to understand the ways in which race and ethnicity identity evolves and the way it really plays out in our society um, and keep up with that and ensure that we're doing all we can to, again, right those wrongs and provide the necessary resources so that everyone has an opportunity to thrive in New York State. Well, we've been speaking with Assemblymember Jessica Gonzalez-Rojas. She is a Queens Democrat. Assemblymember, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, David, for having me. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by Beyond Plastics, which supports the Packaging Reduction and Recycling Infrastructure Act, working to cut plastic packaging in half. Plastics that cannot be recycled end up burned in incinerators, buried in landfills, or polluting rivers and the oceans. More information at beyondplastics.org.